Good morning, and hope everybody enjoyed the delicious coffee break. So this is Kathy Halverson from Michigan Technological University, USA. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of Allison Mills. I'm really glad to have Allison here. She's helped us a lot in terms of thinking about how to communicate science, transdisciplinary research team results to broad audiences. So a thorough and through deep Allison writes university research stories for Michigan Technological University. As director of research news, she also works on strategic communication to help faculty reach audiences outside their professional niches and explore creative media outlets for STEM outreach. She studied geoscience as an undergraduate at Northland College before getting a master's in environmental science and natural resource journalism at the University of Montana. She moonlights as a dance instructor, to be specific, a belly dancing instructor, <laughs> radio theme, and occasional rock liquor. Thank you, Alan. All right, hello, everybody. It's very nice to see you all. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Kathy. I also want to do a little introduction in Spanish because um, I know some of you may appreciate that. And I, I want you to know um, la presentación hoy es en inglés. <laughs> um, pero quiero decir si tienen preguntas um, o confusion. If you have any sort of confusion, por favor, uh, pregúntame en la lengua mejor para usted. ¿Comprenden? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's my bad broken Spanish. <laughs> um, but really, I know that I, especially with this topic, I get really excited about sharing science communication practices. I do tend to speak pretty fast. So at any point, if there is something that you need clarification on, if you need to ask a question, um, please do so and do so in the language that's best for you. There are enough people in the room, um, digitally and in person, who can translate. So, we good to go? Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to sharing my screen real quick. Um, So we're going to be talking about the basics of how to write a news release and science communication best practices. So what I would like to start with is this quote here. So science is not finished until it's communicated. And this is from um, a British scientific advisor. And I think a lot of people agree about this but not everybody agrees on what finish actually means. So within the scientific community, especially with a lot of the researchers I work with at Michigan Tech, or who any of you may be, or maybe you work with other researchers, um, finish often means a professional presentation at a conference. Um, it may mean a poster, it may mean a scientific publication published in a peer-reviewed journal. And these days, speaking to scientific audiences is no longer enough. And I think everyone in this room understands that, and that's why we're going to be talking about how do we go about doing that in the best way possible, because it's different for every single project and every single topic. So, reality check. Uh, how many of you think that this photo is staged? Hopefully a fair number of you, because it is definitely staged. <laughs> um, so what, what you're seeing here is some volumetric flasks, and we set them up because we wanted to get a really pretty shot, um, a pretty photo in one of our chemistry labs. And every single time I use this photo, either on Twitter or in a news story, I get a lot of flack for it. People look at this and they're like, those volumetric flasks are overfilled. Like there's no like chemical that we would ever work with that turns that shade of teal. You've got a hidden political agenda here. How on earth could chemistry ever be so much fun? 
And a lot of a lot of the researchers that we work with have those reactions. But what I think is important to remember, and this is kind of the reality check of science communication, is that scientific communication that you would do in a presentation, a paper, or a poster is not the same as the information and the reality of science communication, which we often shorten to SciComm. And so in SciComm, the process can sometimes feel a little bit forced and unnatural, maybe a little bit staged to some people. And that's because to a certain extent, it is. It's not the same process that you go through um, in an NGO. It's not the same process that you go through in an academic department. It is different. And I think that this photo kind of captures the differences between scientific communication and science communication. And at the fundamental level, even though this is a staged photo, what's really important is to remember to be real when you're communicating. So to me, what's really cool about science communication is that it's it all comes down to storytelling. And when we're sharing a narrative, we're sharing a story, um, people resonate a lot more with that. They feel that story more if we are being real, if we are being authentic, if we're being honest and upfront. And so I like this photo because it's a real researcher's hands um, and she studies earthworms and their effects on maple trees. And so the earthworms come through, they gobble up all of the maple leaf litter, so on the forest floor, and it's actually changing the ecosystem. And so this is a cool staged photo, but it gets at the truth, the, the essence behind her research. So I think keep those two things in mind that sometimes it will feel like you are trying to force your work into an unnatural structure. But what's really, really important fundamentally is to always stay true and be real about the, the science that you're talking about. So let's get into the nitty gritty here. These are the elements that you have to think about before you ever put a word on paper, because otherwise you will just waste words on paper. Um, so the first thing that you have to think about is who do you want to talk to? This is your target audience. And so once you figure out who you're talking to, you have to figure out what you actually want to tell them. And that's your key message. An important thing to remember for um, news communication, um, for communicating via social media. And, you know, honestly, even in like professional, you know, presentations and posters, you still have a target audience and a key message that has to get across. And we, and well, we and you in particular, as some of the smartest people in the world, have so much knowledge in your minds. You know so much. Um, and it can be hard to remember what it is like to be somebody who does not know as much as you do. And so it's worth taking a step back before you ever begin writing and think about the who and the what in your message because it will help clarify and it will help distill down your message so that it is clear and understandable for somebody who does not have the same mind and the same knowledge that you do. And you're gonna have to forgive me a couple of times. I'll have to take a, a tea break. I'm unfortunately trying to kick a head cold right now. So give me just a second. <laughs> okay, so once you figure out the who and the what, then you have to consider how you're going to relay that message. Now, a lot of times we tend to do this in reverse, right? We know how. We know that we want a news release. We know that we want uh, you know, to do a Facebook Live thing or we want a photo. Um, and that's definitely putting the cart before the horse. It's much easier to figure out how once you know who and what. So the how for you guys is actually pretty simple this go around. We know that you are going to be working on a news release um, with our team. And I just want you to be aware that there are other options. 
Um, you may be able to, you know, consider blog posts in the future. Um, social media campaigns can be really effective. Um, and that all comes back to down, comes back to where your target audience is going to be getting your getting that information. And wherever your target audience is, is where you want to be communicating. Um, the other piece that's important to consider is particularly when we're talking about a news release, is that we want to figure out where to publish and where to pitch that story. I sometimes tell the researchers that I work with at Michigan Tech that I have failed in my job if they don't get their story placed anywhere else besides our university news website. Because my job really is to make sure that people off campus are hearing about this work. And so if your goal is to create a story that is going up on your website and it's okay that it stays only there, that's fine. But if your goal is to reach a much bigger audience through other news media, um, through other media channels, then it's really important to consider how, what those channels are and where to publish and pitch. Now, here's my big caveat for all of you. This stuff sounds so easy until you have to do it. And then you realize that there is an elegant complexity to all of this. It seems simple at first, and it's actually very layered, and there are many different nuances. So if you are able to work with a science communication expert, or you have somebody on your team who is particularly good at that, it's really, really helpful to pull that person in and pull them in sooner rather than later so that they can help you um, from the get-go rather than you know, knowing that you have an event in two days, you need a news release, and oh my goodness, it's down to the last minute and we gotta get it done. Um, it is worth pulling them in sooner rather than later if you have the option to work with a science communication team. So the other piece here is that we need good visuals, right? So most humans, in fact, I would dare say like pretty much, yes, we'll just go with most humans. So most people are very visual creatures. We are much more responsive to photos in eye tracking studies. Um, certain photos and certain colors in a certain layout on the page um, will draw people's eye more so than other things. And I wouldn't expect anybody here to like be experts in that. That's what graphic designers are experts in. That's what marketers are experts in. Um, and so again, if you can work with a team, that's really great. But it boils down to at the end of the day that you need a good visual. And another reason for that is you have a single moment to capture someone's attention. You literally, in all of the eye tracking studies um, to date, you have three seconds to catch somebody's attention. And then you have 10 seconds to keep it. So what are the, like, the two most important pieces in a story? Well, it's your photo and your headline, right? And we've all experienced that. You know, we'll, we'll read, we'll see a story, you know, that comes through a Facebook feed or that we find online and the photo is really compelling and there's this clickbait headline and, you know, it grabs you in and tries to get you to read and then you read the story and it doesn't necessarily resonate the same way. It's not exactly the same story that the photo and the headline told you it would be. And that's because people with a lot of money have figured that out and they know how to capture people's attention. So in, for better or worse, it's a game that we also have to play um, in order to get our work out there. Now, coming back to one of my original slides, it's also important to be real and not overstate anything or um, you know say anything that's wrong. But we can learn to play up things in a way that enhances the visual appeal and also enhances um, kind of people's response to the story. So we're going to go through this part. Um, this is how I go about making news stories. And this process will vary a little bit from person to person and from organization to organization. Um, but I think it illustrates the different parts. 
And it also shows how much actually goes into it because it's very easy to assume that writing a 500 word piece is easier than, you know, maybe writing a 2000 word essay on it or, you know, it's, I don't think it's actually easier, or, or excuse me, I don't think it is harder than writing a scientific paper, but that's like, you know, that's a super high caliber of writing to get a peer reviewed paper published. But a news story also has different components and we have to think about all of them in turn as well. So this is a slide more to get you to see the different pieces of the process. So what most people assume is that we post a story, like you write it, you post it, that's it. But there's actually a lot more that goes into this. And so on campus, we have this whole idea generation stage where we're working on defining who, what, and where the story is designed for. And then the writing process comes in and a big part of that is the editing process. And that can go in circles as many times as it needs to, to make sure that the, the information is accurate and accessible. And then the, the last piece is one that often gets overlooked. And this is the pitching component. But really it's one of the most critical components of a news release because if you're not trying to share out that information, it's you have a great story, you have great visuals, and if it doesn't go anywhere, if you don't tell anybody about it, um, then it just doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so one of the things that we hope every time somebody reads a news story of ours, right, or they, we tell them about our work, we want them to have this like whole paradigm shift. You know, we want them to pop out of the egg and go, wow, that was amazing. I can't believe my worldview has totally changed. But in reality, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We're, we're pretty lucky if somebody's like, huh, that's cool, and moves on to reading the next thing. Um, and one of my favorite ways of summarizing, hopefully you can all, all read it. I'll run through it quickly. So this is from PhD Comics, which is hilarious, especially for those of you who have been through grad school. Um, so we often start with, you know, this really clearly defined research within these certain conditions and under these parameters, and there's scientific uncertainty around it, but it's pretty clear. And then the university PR office gets it, you know, it's still pretty clear, but you know, it, the, the, the science itself starts to get softened a little bit. And then it goes to the newswire and, you know, people are like, oh, wow, look, this causes this. And, you know, and all of these scientists are saying it, even though it's one paper. And then it gets onto Reddit, it goes through the whole internet, and it goes through your local cable TV station. And by the time it comes back around to your grandma or your neighbor, they're like, look at what I'm doing. I'm, I'm wearing this silly hat to ward off, you know, such and such thing you wrote about. Isn't that cool? And you just like, it's <laughs> Um, and what I think is important it, to realize in this slide is that this process only happens if you don't take the time to figure out who, what, and where you want that information to go. We can't just like share out information and assume it is going to stay in the same format that we present it. We have to understand that every single part of this process is going to, it's going to interact with the people and the information coming in from multiple inputs. So this is another one that I like to remind people of, um, the organs of communication. So most of us, particularly with science, we appeal to people's rationale, their logic. And where is that appealing to, right? That's appealing to people's heads. Um, but that's also your smallest base because you're asking people to follow logic that you have a mental framework for. Um, so if you want people to have a more human um, personal reaction, you're asking them to, to feel with their heart or to react with their gut or to, you know, you might have sex appeal in your story. And this is, you know, kind of the, the broadest audience that we can reach. And most often we just want people to have an authentic human reaction to our stories. 
And we can't do that by presenting facts. We can, pre we can get them to have a, a, an empathetic or intuitive reaction first and then present facts to them. But if we start with the head, we're gonna have a really hard time um, appealing to anything else. So the way that journalists do this, um, it comes from the old days when newspapers were actually cut, um, cut and pasted into place. So this is called the inverted pyramid. And a, a slightly more succinct way of putting this is that you start with all the important stuff and you get down to the fluff at the end. And that doesn't necessarily mean that fluff isn't important information, that it isn't part of the story. It just means that considering your who, what, and you know where you're targeting this story, that the most important information is distilled and pushed to the top of the story so that everybody is on the same page right away. And this is a very different style of writing. It's like the exact opposite of scientific writing. This would be, it'd be like the inverted, inverted pyramid. Um, so in a, in a paper, right, what do we, we have the abstract, which does distill everything down, um, which is kind of an inverted pyramid in and of itself. But then after the abstract, what do we do? We start with all the background <laughs> so that a scientific audience can work from the same scientific understanding. Um, and then you go through the methodologies and it's not until the very end that you have a discussion about the most important findings in your work. And so to write news material, you have to flip all of that on its head and you have to present the findings and the applications first, and then you can start to whittle down uh, deeper into, into the, the scientific content. So any questions so far? Is everybody clear? All right. Cool. All right, so um, what this translates into what you all will be actually writing, um, this is a structure that you can definitely steal. It's like what every single journalist in the world uses unless they're really creative and have time on their hands, which most of them don't. Um, so you always start with a hook. So what is the most interesting, what is the most interesting thing about this work? And what is going to grab people's attention? Because remember, it comes back to that you have three seconds to capture somebody's attention and 10 seconds to keep it. And then if you keep it, they're only going to stick around for maybe a couple of minutes. So you probably have somewhere around 200 to 300 words before most people start dropping off um, and quit reading stories. Um, so the next piece then is what journalists call a nut graph. And I think of a nut graph as the journalistic equivalent of a scientific abstract. And so you're distilling all of the most important information into a single paragraph so that people could read that single paragraph and know what the entire story is about. It doesn't mean that they know the entire story and that they would have details about it, but they would understand what the story will be about. And then from there, it's really another important piece of news writing that's different than scientific writing is weaving in an actual human voice. So in a lot of um, scientific publications, and this probably isn't quite as true with interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work, we actively take out people's voices, you know, particularly the author's voices, because we're trying to be objective. Um, journalists also want to be objective, but one of their main goals is to get other humans to react to this story. So they're going to put in a human voice. So if you can work on having, you know, high quality, succinct quotes that are memorable, that actually sounds like a human voice and reads like a human voice, um, it makes the story much more compelling. And the sooner you put that in the story, the better. Um, and then from there, I, I usually try to limit myself to having one or two main points that I'm trying to get across um, in communicating that key message, the what of the story. And in doing so, you also then need to weave in more voices. Um, and then later on, it becomes critical to explain, you know, the logical aspects of the story. So the methodologies, all of the supporting details, and then the very, very last thing that you do 
is list collaborators and funders. It is critical to acknowledge all of those people. Um, it is not going to get somebody to read your story if they are the first sentence in a piece. Um, sometimes we even get away with having all of that information in the sidebar um, because it, it, it is crucial information and in fact sometimes it needs to be highlighted. Um, and it can be difficult to do that and have a nice flow, a nice narrative in the story itself. So sometimes it's worth calling out in an entirely separate spot um, or having it all in italics or something like that. Because um, it is important information for journalists to know, but it is hard to read sometimes. So the other piece that I wanted to bring up with you today is the fact that um, news media itself is really, really changing. And a surprising majority of people get their news and information about their interests through social media. Um, this is particularly true for breaking news on Facebook and Twitter, um, but pretty much every single social media website, whether it's Reddit, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, there's a whole slew of them. People get a lot of information through these sites. And so there are many, many eyeballs that you can capture their attention if you are plugged into social media. And it is worth thinking strategically about if you have a, a written document that is your news release, how can you then share that out on social media so that you're maximizing your impact and hopefully helping lead people back to the longer content in your actual news release and then from there, directing them into the even longer content and more in-depth content of your scientific paper. So here are some myths that um, some of our researchers believe. The first is that the public can't understand my science. Pa. <laughs> well, I'm really proud of you, smarty pants, um, but that's just not true. It's not that the, the public can't understand science, it's that they don't have the same framework. So they're not going to understand scientific figures. They're not going to understand most methodologies or um, analysis, but they do understand a lot of scientific concepts and they are particularly attuned to the application of science in their everyday life. Now, the second one is that my post can't compete with cat videos. Well, no duh. <laughs> I don't think anybody's science um, can compete with cat videos. I'm pretty sure that Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson can't compete with cat videos. So what is important to remember is that the goal isn't to compete with cat videos. The goal of every news release, of every of communicating every project is going to vary depending on who you're talking to, what message you're trying to get across, and where that message is going out. Um, and that will rarely mean that you have, um, that will rarely mean that you have uh, a million views, a million viral views on your story. So then this last one is that social media is for personal use only. And what I wanna point out for this one is that social media is capital S social, lowercase media for a reason. It is definitely about being human and about sharing your person, your persona with other people. But you, it's also a little bit of a mask. You can have a professional persona you can have a personal social media account, but the only person who gets to decide what those boundaries are is you. Um, so let's go through some of the actual benefits then for researchers. So we've got networking is a really big one, um, which can be crucial for sharing out stories. Bonus number two is accessibility. Having information on social media makes your work much easier to find. And if you are able to distill it down to 140 characters in a tweet, then you probably know what your research is about and have a pretty good sense of how to communicate it to other people. Uh, and then the last one, this is for academics. Um, altmetrics is a really big thing and some universities actually use um, figures about 
uh, well, and I shouldn't say figures. So metrics about you know how many times a news story was shared, um, how much people tweeted about a paper to actually inform decisions about tenure and you know people's career tracks. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, and then the one that I think of for news releases, that is free marketing. So this is a space that we can share out that information. And yes, we are providing information and we can talk much longer about privacy issues on social media. Um, but it is, it is totally worth sharing out news re releases here. And you don't have to have your own account. So I would encourage people to consider having organizational, lab accounts, department accounts, NGO accounts, and employing those accounts to maximize your story. So let's bring this back to maybe some of the questions that you all have and talk through your news releases. Um, just as a quick summary, what I noticed um, in the news releases I read is that we need we need a sharper hook. <laughs> Remember, you only have three seconds to capture somebody's attention. So a headline, the opening sentence, and then having some sort of visual can be really, really helpful. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys to see if you have questions. Anyone? <laughs> Uh, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering about that catch the attention um, suggestion you have. You know, the scientists that I see at the university anyway are those to overstate what they know. They don't like alarmism. Um, they, you know, want it to be understood in the context of this is what we found, but it's not necessarily true. It's just what we found. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the surprise thing would be different for researchers probably than for journalists, even though it probably shouldn't be. But what are some good books for science in terms of elements of surprise? You know, certainly we're not telling you that someone died usually or something like that. You know, the typical ways to get surprised. Right. Yeah, there's a saying in journalism that if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> um, which kind of tells you how journalists think about capturing somebody's attention. Um, but really, I think with science, I understand scientists' concerns about not overstating their work. And that's really important. Um, but if we also can't connect science to the bigger picture, then it we kind of lose the value of science for society at large. And so having that conversation with scientists and explaining that this is tied into their broader impacts, that this is connected to their ability to get future funding and ability to communicate to policies or policy makers so that they can continue to get funding to do their research. I mean, I hate to have like a carrot and stick approach, but sometimes getting researchers to understand those aspects will help them scale back a little bit so they're like, okay, this is the the world that I work in, and I need to start looking at how it's connected to the rest of this world. Um, and that varies project by project. So we actually try out a lot of different headlines. Um, we will write out numerous different headlines, and we will write out different introductions just to see which one works best. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, and sorry, you cut out a little bit on that one, so you could we say that? Can you think of an example of a good title as a book in science or science findings? I think I'm still missing part of the message. Do you guys mind like typing it in? There's just a little bit of some interference going on. Um, we're we're asking for an example of a book mm. for scientific findings. Yeah. Okay. So one actually that I just came across today that I'm really excited about. Um, so in terms of an example, uh, so I talked with a researcher about some Antarctic zircon data that they have, and they're connecting it to some of the world building that happened with Gondwana, 
you know, 500, 700 million years ago. That sounds really, really boring when I put it that way. But the researcher today proposed having a title called A Series of Fortunate Events. And so tying it into pop culture is just enough for somebody to be like, ha, that's funny. And then we can actually talk about the science because it really is about a, a series of events that led to the volcanism that this particular researcher is studying. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this question just uh, uh, add a tip from my perspective and say if you want to communicate science to not science, uh, just ask your transdisciplinary team. Uh, and if you don't want, uh, a team will be built one. Naturally, it's a uh, cost thematic, but uh, I think from my perspective that if you don't have the vision, uh, it's maybe difficult or take a long time uh, through uh, blogs or, or inter interactions with the community. Um, and maybe it's easier if you build a transparent team uh, to, to build your communication or your, your risk. Thanks. So I want to make sure that I, I understand this one. So it's about um, how to build up some of that community relationship to communicate science. Is that? Yeah, and what I mean is uh, that uh, uh, just a tip will be ask your transdisciplinary team, ask, mm -hmm. ask people that are not involved in your, in your work to, to communicate, communicate this year, and yeah. the way that the people will understand. Yeah, and a great example of that with the story that we're even working on right now um, came out of a transdisciplinary story locally here in the Keweenaw. And they did several focus groups with um, a local tribe. And so the story would have been about biogeochemistry modeling and how mercury and PCBs interact with the atmosphere and with water. And you know what that all got distilled down into? It was a single question. And the question is, when can we eat the fish? because that's what the community cared about. And so that's a, a perfect example of how tapping into that transdisciplinary team um, can help refine that message. Right, exactly. And so um, you got his point that you have members on a transdisciplinary team. It's not just scientists, it's other people are part of that too. Um, hi, that was a great presentation. Thank you. I have a couple of, of comments. Um, the first talking about the hook, uh, we were just really fortunate uh, a few months ago to have our story on National Geographic magazine. And the title was, like, how to get a manta ray makeover. And that was, like, really um, powerful. But um, going back to what you were talking about, uh, how this, like, stories, you know, end up kind of, like, losing themselves in, in this huge circle. Like, working, for example, with National Geographic, like, we have really good, like, fact checkers and, and everything went really great. But... It, it's happened to me like before in my work as well that you get out for like a news release and that is she still there? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> um, uh, but then sometimes like the story kind of like loses itself, and when you're working with reporters, sometimes reporters one they won't let you like fact check or they'll you know put out some stuff and leave out other stuff maybe sometimes even putting in like incorrect data, um, that's something that you didn't say. So sometimes you kind of like lose control over these kind of like press stories. So I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to uh, control as much as possible so that these issues don't come out later. Because then you're like looking at some of these stories and saying like, I didn't say this, or you know, they didn't incorporate this. So how, how do you manage that? Yeah, so, and it does come with the caveat that some journalists are going to come with an agenda because they have a story in their mind that they want to tell and you are simply a tool to tell that story that happens um so in an actual interview i like to remind folks that if you are being interviewed you are actually the one in control you get to set the tone of that interview 
Um, journalists use specific tactics to try to get a response out of you. So they may say things that might make you a little uncomfortable or call you out on things. So they're trying to get you to have an emotional response so that you give them a better quote. So if you think about it beforehand, and you know what your story is and really keep coming back to like, this is what the story is about. Even if you feel like a broken record and you just keep coming back, that can really help. And actually, if you have the chance to practice that with other people, like do some role play, or if there is a journalist that you trust who you are willing to do kind of like a mock interview with, that can also be really helpful. Or if anybody has access to, you know, a science PIO like myself, um, we do that a lot with researchers so that they can practice. That was great. Thank you. Just, just one additional thing because I, I understand that part of the like, emotional thing, and that happened to me as well. Like, you know, trying to like not, you know, give in to what they want you to say because that sometimes is feel as well as what they want you to say. Um, but how do you how do you manage with like data? Like Naomi was saying that sometimes you know you have particular data or you don't want to say a particular thing, but then they end up saying it anyways. So that that can also happen. Yes. So two things to remember. The first is that everything is on the record with the journalist. And this is particularly difficult if you like because I imagine like you've gone out like on a lot of like boat rides and everything, and I imagine a journalist might come along on that, they are in reporter mode the entire time. So there is no downtime for them. Anything that you say, even if you're like, this is some preliminary data that you know I'm excited about, and then they happen to feature that in the story, it's because you're on record all of the time. There is really no such thing as going off the record. It just, that doesn't happen unless it is a sanctioned, like government or um, organizational um, embargo on that. Um, and then the other piece is um, you can ask them to like review stuff. And in fact, sometimes it's really helpful, especially after you feel like you've given them a lot of information or maybe you've shown them some of your data to be like, OK, so what pieces are you going to include in the story? I just want to help you have a more accurate story. Because accuracy is the currency of journalism. They care about being accurate. And so if you tell them that you were trying to help them have the most accurate information possible, they're more likely to run things by you. They will never run a full story by you. Um, but they may be willing to say like, yeah, so I'm still a little confused on this part. Could you help clarify that for me? Um, they're, most of them will not let you review quotes. Um, you won't get to review the whole story, but you can ask to go over that information with them to make sure that they understand it. And it's okay to have to do that several times over because they may say something and you're like, yeah, this is what your research is about. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> and it's okay to have that reaction and just be like, okay, let's like work this out. It's the same thing on a transdisciplinary team, right? You think you've been really clear communicating to one of your partners who's in a different field and you realize that maybe that wasn't as clear as you thought and you have to go over that material again. All right, Allison, um, that was terrific. Thank you very much for your hard work being together. Yeah, well, thank you all for having me.